Well, here's the third quarter. I guess we can now discuss it. You can read a little bit more, or Mike is going to talk about it. Thanks, Dave. As Ali said, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I think in contrast to some earlier speakers, I have a bad tendency to be very loud in uh, big room settings. So tell me if I end up speaking so loudly it hurts your ears. Um, so uh, what I'm gonna talk about today is going to work with Ali. Uh, we're also, we're parts of this are related to work with uh, Chris. And the, the big idea today is very much inspired by some of their some of their previous work in the uh, setting of singular and non Uh I wanted to give a bit of a warning on the board ahead of time. Um, my sketch here is first I want to say like what the big problem is that we have to try and solve to get to an answer here. Then to say what the solution is, why you know why we care, what that gets us, and then finally for most of the talk, like where the solution comes from, why is the natural idea to get that. The problem is a technical problem. So I don't really have any choice but to get a little bit technical at the very beginning, or according to the graph, fairly technical at the beginning. But I hope to ease off as soon as I possibly can. So just fair warning. Uh, I hope not to not to go off the deep end and never reconnect with her. So uh, I'll even discuss in the last talk that for an intermodal use here. You obtain this VG lambda module, which we usually call the tilde complex, C tilde of Y, very creative with names. And for rational homology series, you get something there too. But um, I mean, with, with this construction, as with any construction in floor theory, it depends on some choices. Uh, when you're doing intersection theory, you need to perturb your things to make them transverse. If you're doing gauge theoretic floor homology, you need to choose a perturbation of your Morse homology. Branch of floor theory, you need some almost complex structure and Hagar floor theory, some choice of Hagar splitting. There's always some auxiliary data that shows up in your construction. You want to make sure it doesn't depend on that auxiliary. And um, for about three years after I wrote my thesis, I was sad because it, it seemed a priori to depend on that auxiliary data. And I want to say why. Like, first, what's the issue there that we have to get around? To actually show that we get well defined invariants here. And this is going to be related to the inequality of growth at the end of this last talk. Um, oftentimes, in worse theory or theoretic floor homologies, the way you argue that this is independent of choice. Is to construct a pair of maps and some homotopies between the relevant objects. Usually, by whatever that means. Contains instantons on the cylinder, where your equation is perturbed by some uh, perturbation which runs between two perturbations on both sides. The big problem, the fundamental issue here, is that you can't. For us, uh, our perturbations, uh, oftentimes, you'll be in a situation where I need to construct one of these maps, but there is there is a literal obstruction to defining the other one. It simply cannot be defined. And so I can't argue that the two things are homotopy equivalent because I can't construct a homotopy inverse. And What's going on here is that there is a certain collection. Oh, let me back up. More generally than cylinders, if I have a phlogorism 
And I'm just going to kind of standing simplify an assumption that it's first betting number is zero, which means rational homology spheres. There's a certain collection of instantons on this, which are special. We have to keep track of all the reducible instantons. I can enumerate these explicitly. Essentially, they depend on a choice of second cohomology class on W. Uh, these correspond to a reduction of some SU2 bundle into a pair of line bundles, and this second term, this uh, first term class, well, sorry, this C will be the first term class of that line bundle. Now, when you study some equation, uh, some homolytic PD on these manifolds, you have a corresponding Morse index, which tells you the expected dimension of the moduli space it fits inside. And when you have a reducible connection, you actually have two indices to keep track of. The first is just the expected dimension of the modular space instantons. The uh, space of things you're trying to count points in to begin with. And the second, well, I mentioned that this such a reducible comes from a reduction of this SU2 bundle to uh, a line bundle. And you can study the ASE equations on line bundles. You can study the uh, instantons on U1 bundles. And correspondingly, You have a reducible index, which tells you what you expect the dimension of the space of reducible instantons of that topological pattern to be. And um, I have a smooth manifold, and I have a submanifold of that. The dimension of the submanifold ought to be smaller. Correspondingly, if I want to find some perturbation of my equations where these moduli spaces are cut out smoothly, so they're smooth manifolds, this reducible index should be less than or equal to the honest index of this ASD connection. And, and this is the origin of a bunch of fundamental issues in the instant time theory. That's just often false. Uh, the most basic example here, the most fundamental example, maybe, is that the reducible instant time corresponding to the trivial cohomology class is the trivial connection on that four manifolds. And now, the difference between these, I red minus I, which I want to be non-positive, 
don't want higher end to be bigger than I. Can be computed from the ATS or index here. And actually, rather, you just write down fairly explicitly what the relevant uh, values are. This is three times B plus a W. Uh, and I think you've seen plenty of manifolds where B plus a W is positive. If at least glancing at it, this gives this means hopeless to try and define an instant positive variance or coordinates of that or whatever. When you have a Cohortism or manifold which is not negative definite, uh, whenever B plus a W is positive, you run into this uh, obstructed connection. And this is actually the issue I was pointing to earlier as well. I mentioned that you have to choose these perturbations to define the tilde complexes in the first place. And when you write down this cohortism, cylinder equipped with some perturbations running from one on one side to one on the other side. In many cases, you'll find that there are obstructed uh, reducible flat connections, reducible instantons. And when that happens, I, I mean, I, I just don't know by counting things how to define a smooth map because I end up, uh, I, I can't count points in non smooth manifolds. I have some. If I have some uh, zero, something which looks mostly zero dimensional where those points accumulate to a line, I don't know how to count those points. That's, that's just one of the instructions. So I get, I get an issue like this for every different, every different uh, homology class C. So what you just pointed out is that there is no issue in why is a rational homologist here. Because then the only issue, the only possible issue is the trivia connection. And that's no problem here. But when you're working with rational homology series, suddenly you have this subject. Suddenly you have obstructed abelian connections which show up. Yeah, like COVID variant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I want to avoid talking about the, the rubber variants in particular. But yeah, you can write down very explicitly what this left hand side here is in terms of the four manifold and the three manifold on the X. And the formula involves rubber variants. Some data coming from the variations and whatnot. Uh, and just often it's negative. So the, the picture or the sort of thing that happens here. Is that you'll have some modular space where much of it is a smaller dimension than the than the reducible parts. This cannot possibly be a smooth animal. I've drawn it so it looks as sad as these maybe when I find them. Um, so this is in that graph I drew earlier, roughly the peak of the technicality here. Uh, this is the issue. We have these obstructed reducible connections. You can determine explicitly when they're obstructed. Uh, it happens. It happens a lot. It's irritating, to say the least. But so there's a solution. Unfortunately, I look a lot more egotistical than describing my joint work with all these um, Yeah, If you have a rational homology sphere, why? What we show 
that there's a certain construction you can carry out on these on the DG modules, C tilde, called the suspension. The not not exactly like suspension algebraic topology, but it shares, shares enough formal properties that uh, we like the name. Written S C tilde of Y. So that first of all, there is a canonical equivariant map from a tilde complex to its suspension, which is not a homotopy equivalence, but it does induce an isomorphic homology. So if you're interested in homology, or more broadly, if you're interested in constructions coming from equivariant homology, plus minus infinity type things, then these are roughly the same thing. You can consider them roughly interchangeably from that perspective, from the interest of those things alone. And when I say this is not a homotopy equivalent, I don't mean you can't prove it, it's on the interest of time. It's false. And secondly, if I have a cohortism between two rational homology spheres, if I suspend this complex enough times, I actually do get an equivariant map from C tilde of Y to this infold suspension of C tilde of Y prime. And you can determine explicitly from these indices, from this information just about the four manifold and the three manifolds, how many times it is that you need to suspend. Construction is fairly flexible. Um, well, I guess I won't say what that means. And because this infold suspension has this canonical quasi isomorphism to it coming from C tilde to Y prime, I do get an induced map on homology. I do get an induced map on equivariant homology. Uh, and so, from, the, from that perspective, uh, it's as good as if I constructed a cohortus map from the homology of Y or the homology of Y prime. So oh, I had four points there. The first was the problem. The second was the solution. Next, I was going to tell you about the upshots here. Before doing so, is there anything else? Is there anything about this so far I could clarify or say uh, productively? Yeah. Exactly. The, the lambda equivariance is crucial here. Um, it's, it's, it's actually closely related to the fact that if you're trying to find Kohler's instant homology for rational homology spheres, that does depend on the choice of perturbation. You can recover that from these complexes. And the version of irreducible instant homology for the suspension has ranked one larger. So it, it jumps as you suspend. And uh, is there any geometric meaning of this construction of the suspension? And um, is, so I said that I had this number that I didn't want to be non-negative. Um, I didn't want to be positive, rather. And is the largest of those numbers. So if you can compute all those numbers, you know what x. Actually, you can sort of just, well, let me not get too technical with that. I promise I was leveling off. 
maybe let me say some corollaries of this fact. I don't want to write this on the board, but this construction is um, functorial in the appropriate sense and uh, well defined up to homotopy. So it's it essentially with this with this with this does it goes that this instant homology is going to be functorial on rational homology spheres and cohortisms between them. It solves the issue of this these obstructed black actions. The first thing I want to say. And this is actually the context where we thought about suspension in the first place. So it's not the application I'm going to focus on today. Is that the equivariant quasi isomorphism type of this complex is actually independent of the perturbation. If you wanted some something about this, which depended on the homotopy type, not the quasi isomorphism type, you're out of luck. But if you pay attention to which of your constructions don't change under equivariant quasi isomorphisms, all of those survive. You do get well defined invariants of rational homology spheres. Um, and in particular, since I keep mentioning equivariant homology, let me say that there are well defined modules over the two variable polynomial rank, the cohomology of BSO3. Which fit into an exact triangle. And there are other equivariant cohomology type of uh, constructions you could do. So Ali pointed out you can restrict to this sub ring lambda prime. You can talk about the equivariant cohomology with respect to that sub ring and get a variance out of that. Give the first step for why this is true. These perturbations pi and pi prime can be organized into different open sets of perturbations, chambers of perturbations, which somehow depend on those indices I mentioned earlier. Um, these, uh, I'm not going to talk about how they're ordered, but there, there are chambers and there's also an adjacency between chambers. Any two perturbations can be linked by a sequence of adjacent perturbations. If you have two adjacent perturbations, pi bigger than pi prime, then I do get an equivariant chain map from the tilde complex with respect to pi to the tilde complex with respect to pi prime, but not the other way around. But if I suspend on the right side, um, nope, left side. Then I do have an equivariant chain map to the suspension. And there is also an equivariant chain map from the suspension. Which are homotopy inverse to one another. And in particular, this continuation map phi. Is a quasi isomorphism. All of your continuation maps are quasi isomorphisms. And as a result, 
this gadget is looking independent of that choice of perturbation, at least it's quasi isomorphic. Yes. We can use this to, I mentioned earlier that there's a relation to the flower's irreducible instant cohomology here. You can use this to understand how that changes as you pass between adjacent chambers, a bit like how you understand how the Cassin invariant change, Cassin Walker invariant changes as you move between different types of perturbation data for that. Um, work in progress. Like also with Chris. We expect to be able to use this to construct the surgery triangle. There are uh, some issues doing this naively. Uh, one of those maps always had B plus positive. We want to use these suspensions to try and resolve those issues to show that there actually is a surgery triangle relating these equivariant floor homologies. And lastly, the thing I want to focus on today for the rest of this talk Is the inequality Ali mentioned earlier? I have a four manifold satisfying this condition on its first homology. Then there's this absolute bound from above and below on this Q3 invariant of its boundary in terms of B minus of that four manifold from above and minus B plus from below. What I want to do for the rest of the talk is prove that inequality in the simplest possible case. Uh, prove it when I have some four manifold whose first homology is trivial and for which B plus of W is equal to one. Um, just prove the lower bound there. Ali mentioned this has some orientation reversal properties. So if you prove the lower bound, then you get the upper bound for three as well. Uh, and in trying to do so, you end up sort of stumbling upon suspension on, on the way. I mentioned earlier that we were really focused on, on this when we were thinking about suspension for the first time, but it appears really naturally when trying to understand uh, relative invariance for manifolds with B plus positive. Before I jump into that, is there anything I can uh, comment on so far? But my perturbations and in, in the settings we're talking about, uh, everything is already low but even on the reducible locus. You just assume that nothing changes there. They vanish on the reducibles, but they're usually non-trivial perturbations. And actually in the in the construction of these. Yeah, let me let me just say that for now. We'll talk more about that maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I didn't I didn't talk about that so much, but sort of what what the suspension does is it. Secretly, sort of replaces Y, Y5 with a new algebraically 
it acts as though you shifted those indices. So uh, when you reverse the orientation of the bonus on a four manifold, when you flip it around, in this, let me let me be naive here for the cylinder. Uh, the indices are negative. So if, if algebraic the indices look like zero, you actually end up getting a map both ways. Uh, a more general discussion earlier says that so long as M and N are chosen in a smart way, you get a map from the M fold suspension to the N fold suspension. So here, N would be one, N would be zero, to the map the other way. Anything else I can say? Thank you. Okay, so to explain where the suspension comes from, I want to take a step back and say a little bit more, I'll read about where, how, how these complexes are defined. But he asked if I would say a few words, and I said only a few, and uh, I'll try and stick with that. As I said, Trying to, we're trying to get past, be past the tactical part. Um, broadly speaking, because we're looking at SO3 equivariant Morse theory, this is really the theory of a Morse bot function, something where the critical loci are smooth submanifolds instead of critical points. And uh, just in more theory, chain complexes come from having a collection of points. Uh, so, well, let me just state the statement here. Chain complexes in more spot theory come from flow categories in the, in the simplest sense possible. Nothing fancy with orientations or framings or anything. In fact, I'm looking with F2 coefficients here, so I don't even need orientations on any of the objects involved. To me, a flow category is a list of critical manifolds, alpha, beta, gamma, and so on. Um, these correspond to the irreducible flat, kind of the, the various orbits of framed flat connections that Ali mentioned. You get an SO3 for the irreducibles. You get a point for the trivial connection. And a collection of manifolds with corners representing moduli spaces of flow lines between these things. Uh, for us, these are framed instantons on a cylinder. You have some base points. So, which you use to keep track of this framing data. Uh, you look at the collection of instantons, uh, pairs of instantons, and framings at that base one on the cylinder, modulo gauge transformations. There is a way to take a framed instanton and parallel transport that framing to the two ends. And in this way, um, Associated to a framed instanton on the cylinder, I get maps to alpha and beta saying what's the limiting data at plus and minus infinity? Where does that framing get sent to as a parallel transport to plus or minus infinity? And when I say that this is a full category, what I mean is that this collection of manifolds has to satisfy a certain boundary relation. 
the boundary of each of these things should break up as the union over all the ways this could break as a trajectory from alpha to beta and then from some beta to gamma. But the framing data in the middle should match up. I'm not going to write a product, rather, I'm going to write a private product here. That's the main difference from what you see in the usual course theory, where you're expecting that the boundary of your uh, spaces of trajectories is split up as a product of trajectories from X to Y and then from Y to Z. Here I'm writing a fiber product instead. Then associated to this, and it's very most of the details here. You get an associated chain complex who's as a graded group graded vector space you get uh, the direct sum of all the cellular chain complexes of those individual orbits and so this first point is going to be uh, not relevant in your case of interest Differential will combine the cellular differential on each of those pieces with something which counts points in various moduli spaces of interest using a fiber product construction. Um, and I haven't mentioned the, the module structure so far. If a group G, your SO3, Acts on everything in sight in a compatible way, then you would have the DG module structure on this object, the DG module over the chains on SO3 here, the, the homology of SO3. Almost briefly about relative in there. It's a little bit early. And you have a flow category. There's a related notion, which here I'll call a flow module which will maybe make sense after I write down the relevant relation in just a minute. And if you're looking for cycles in this chain complex, the way you'll find them in nature comes from these flow modules. All right, you can tell this and this strongest one out here. Um, for each critical orbit alpha, you should have some manifold with corners in of alpha and a map to alpha. The way you should expect to see this in nature is coming from some form some four manifold W with a frame to base point. The map to alpha is again one of these parallel transport maps off to infinity. 
And again, these need to satisfy a boundary relation to guarantee that you'll actually get a cycle. Boundary of each of these kind of betas. We split it as a union over all the other alphas. Those rankings and an alpha by the product with the modulus space running from alpha to beta. Then counting points in these modular spaces in the right way will give rise to a cycle in that chain complex. Um, and in particular, Ali mentioned the importance of the trivial connection earlier. I'll say that the component of this above the trivial connection is literally the number of elements in the modular space can of data. I, I know I'm being a bit vague here. Um, this is the few words that I was going to say about the definition, but I want to sort of pitch a philosophy here. If I'm looking for chain complexes, I'm looking for collections of manifolds satisfying the right boundary relation. If I'm looking for cycles, I'm looking for collections of manifolds satisfying the right boundary relation. Anything I can say about this philosophy or what I talked about here before moving on to using it? Have all the structure to define a, a, a you know, top one space because it's a low category. I mean, once if you're just saying you, you have a low category in hand, what, what are you missing here? Um, um framing, maybe, you know, uh, yeah, there, there's a handful of technical things. Part of it is the periodic structure of these things, so like you're really doing circle value more theory. Um, you might expect to assemble it the spectrum, but then you need something framing flying around there. There's also some issues with non compactness here. I'm sweeping it all out of the rub, but you only have these through a certain dimension. Uh, and if you're not going to pull the way up, you've got no shot. Um, but this is an opera homology. Anything else I can say? I have a question. I have point at the starting point. Back in the day, where somebody wants to take the sort of one spot that has to be. Uh, I'm requiring the endpoint in the starting. Uh, yeah, the endpoint in the starting point should be the same. Okay, same, same. Thanks for all the great questions. Um, so let me point out where these come from. I mean, these, I already mentioned, these come from moduli space with instant on a cylinder with specified asymptotics. Now that I've doodled that alpha and beta on the board, the trace of work. And that gives rise to this chain complex CLBY that uh, gives us all of our fun invariants. But let me try and say where, where you get these moduli spaces and a beta. Um, yeah. I have a four manifold whose first homology is zero, whose boundary is an integer homology sphere, and for which B plus of W is zero. Then you do get two manifolds. There's no obstructed elements like I mentioned earlier. The, these modular spaces really are smooth, uh, compact where it matters. Um, this and they satisfy the right boundary by fluent theory. And as a result, 
and have a well-defined relative invariant in C tilde of Y associated to such a core manifold. But Well, here's. If I work with something with those same assumptions, ex except that B plus of this still, okay, yeah. uh, except that B plus of W is positive, the trivial connection becomes an issue, becomes your main issue. Um, it wants to. in a space of dimension minus 3b plus, but it's there, so it's not. It's in a space of non-negative dimension. Uh, and this gets back to that picture I drew earlier. Um, kind of a comic book picture. It doesn't really describe the story perfectly here, because I don't know how to draw a space of dimension minus 3b plus. But picture you might have is that if you look at the space connections running to some alpha, not necessarily the trivial connection, you have this sort of add locus. Of instantons would break through the trivial connection. And it should have dimension, that's not what it was from, but it should have dimension minus 3b plus smaller than it, it should have dimension 3b plus smaller than it does. Well, I can't count points in this. I don't get anything even remotely like the smooth manifold. I don't get a flow module. I don't get a cycle. There is a naive way to try and fix this. It doesn't work, but you know, not give up. Well, I have this stuff I don't like, but I should get rid of this. If I just delete that locus, I'm left with something non compact, going to have trouble counting points again. But if I systematically remove a neighborhood of the bad locus, The resulting object is essentially a smooth animal, but in the process, I had a couple of new boundary points that weren't there before. Simplify the rest of this discussion. Um, let me now go back to that assumption I mentioned I was going to make earlier. Um, assume that B plus of W is one for the sake of conversation. In any case, but in, including this case, we can say what this new boundary locus is. I don't want it there, but at least I know what it is. Um, when these connections are unobstructed, we get these boundary relations from fluid here. When they're obstructed, we get the corresponding boundary relations from obstructed fluid here. Not every flow line will actually be able to glue to the trivial connection. 
there's a map governing those which do. A map of R3, uh, if B plus was larger, would be R to the 3 B, uh, R to the 3 B plus. And the new boundary component is the zero set of this smooth map. More precisely, what I actually find is that instead of this relation, the one written here, which I'd like these to satisfy, I have an extra boundary relation. So it, it doesn't define a cycle in that chain complex. But I want to decide what I wanted it to satisfy the boundary relation without that extra term. So approach one is to give up and do something else with your life. Uh, approach two is to see if you can somehow correct for that, add a term which uh, resolves the failure of that to be a cycle in our chain complex. Solution is to invent a new flow category where that extra term is built in to the definition. And this is our so called suspension in this special case. The objects are almost like they were before. We have the irreducible flat connections alpha. We have the trivial connection theta on Y. But I'm also going to add a new two sphere as a critical locus here. Which I'll think of as being the unit sphere inside of that obstruction space, R3. you the space of the flow line. I'm going to write a big matrix. It's not too big. I'm going to write a matrix. The flow lines running between two irreducible flat connections are exactly the same as they were before. Nothing flows to the trivial connection anymore. Instead, now, I let everything flow to the two sphere with an extra S2 factor telling me what the map to the two sphere is going to be. There's a sphere, there's a sphere towards the uh, trajectories connecting the two sphere to the trivial connection. And the things which run from the trivial connection to beta. I now the zero set that I wanted to bake into my differential. As for this last term, you construct some, some matrix like this. There's only one thing so you can actually fit in there. So this satisfies the right boundary relations. 
is the real blow up of this max I. Uh, is I delete the zero set and replace it with a two sphere across that zero set. And this map, uh, this now has a well defined map. Side lined up by the normal side mapping to that two scale. I'm running out of time. So instead of sort of talking about how this runs through the relevant relations, let me say that it's not too hard to see that this actually does satisfy the flow category relations. And this is what gives rise to our complex, he's in the intertermology in your case, the suspension of C tilde of one. And the modulized space that I mentioned before now actually do define a flow, a flow module over this flow category. This extra term here, meaning the trivial connection, is exactly what I needed to correct for that original failure. Now, let me maybe say some quick words about phrase out and variance to see. Um, why this relates to that inequality I mentioned earlier at all. If I have some lambda module and a cycle in it, which pairs with the trivial connection to give me one, then it's an algebra. Shows you that the Q3 invariant of this complex is non negative. And this Basically, the standard proof. That if I Y bounds a four manifold W, which is negative definite, the story shot invariants are non negative. It's phrased differently in different sources, but um, this, this somehow is the core of, of that argument. Mentioned earlier that when I have a four manifold with boundary, which is negative definite, then I do get a cycle in this flow category. Sorry, a cycle in this chain complex satisfying that relation. So the Q3 invariant is something that the Q3 invariant of a format of a net of the boundary of the negative and the four manifold is not negative. All that's left is to point out that because this suspension is very concrete, well. You can write down the relevant uh, algebraic construction that you get out of this fairly simply. You can see without too much trouble that suspending shifts the invariant Q3 by one. And furthermore, I now have the right type of cycle in this suspension. I now have If I have a four manifold of B plus equals one, 
in such a cycle in the suspended complex. So the Q3 invariant of the suspended complex is not negative. That was the Q3 invariant of Y itself, shifted up by one. So that tells us that the Q3 invariant is at least minus one when you bound something with B plus equals one. And the general case is sort of just a slight enhancement of this argument where you have to carry the suspension procedure to get a relative invariant in the B plus full suspension. I think that's all I have to say.